I'm Connie. This is Diane, and neither, neither of us are Lori Desitals, but we know her. Okay, so, so there you go. So hopefully that'll help. So um, I just wanted to tell you we are really excited to be able to be here today. And um, we're here because of the incredible experiences we've had in working with Dr. Lori. Um, and basically what we want to do is share what we've learned. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about St. Mary's in our context. Um, we provide high quality early learning experiences for 224 children every day at five sites. So we have, a, um, we have classrooms downtown at Fort Harrison. We're at the IPS Butler Lab School. We have a classroom at the IMA in Studio 2 or 1, 2. And um, we also are at St. Anthony's School in Hawville. And our work is inspired by the work of the educators in the municipal preschools in Reggio Emilia, Italy. Um, we also provide food, social services, um, a great focus on family engagement and therapies for the children that we serve. St. Mary's, in order to do our work, we raise funds for 56% of our children to provide full scholarships um, so that they can attend school. And we also teach community educators about the work that we're doing through Diane's program. 93% of our children live in poverty, and it was really interesting to hear the presentation about children in poverty and how um, hard that is for children, how devastating it can be to their development. So we know that children in poverty, for instance, enter school a year and a half to two years behind developmentally than their middle class peers. One of the reasons is they lack the experiences that are common to other kids. For instance, um, and I'm, you've I know you've heard this, but um, children by the age of three who live in poverty have heard 30 million fewer words than children in the middle class. And um, it's not just the words that are important, it's the serve and return and the conversations that are had between the parent and the child. Um, we know also, according to Marion Wright Edelman, and she is the CEO and founder of the Children's Defense Fund in DC, um, we know what she has to say about children in poverty, and she told us and um, I got to go to see her in a conference at Butler several years ago. And that night she said two things that really sat heavy on my heart. Number one, that children in poverty enter what's called the cradle to prison pipeline at the moment of their birth. And unless something happens along the way, it's their destiny. In fact, she said that one in three little boys who are poor and black go to prison, even though they're citizens in the United States of America. And when we look at this and you look at these strong, competent, capable little guys from St. Mary's, the essential question is which one? And that's hard to live with. We also know that children in poverty are disproportionately exposed to those factors that impair brain development. And they are, and you've heard it probably all day, adversity and trauma, which makes it difficult for children to self-regulate, to make connections, and to learn. So when we talk to Dr. Lori, what she will tell us is that our children come in, and I like the way she says that, she says they're rough when they come in. And we see that. Um, they're hypervigilant, um, they're active. If you, put your, if you get behind them and you lean down to give them a hug around the front, um, their little hearts are beating 50,000 beats a minute. Um, it's all right there. So. Um, that's how they are when they come in, and our job is to find ways to dampen down the child's response to the adversity and trauma, and to allow the child to make those connections and to self-regulate and to learn. So we've experienced a miracle because Dr. Lori came our way. And we met her through Dr. Ina Shelley, who is the Dean of the College of Education at Butler University, who is a wonderful friend of ours and also a partner, particularly in our study of the Reggio philosophy. Um, so we started out just watching Dr. Lori's TEDx presentation. We were invited to conference, we've read her books and materials, which by the way, she shares so freely and everywhere. Um, we invited her to come to present to our staff and finally, Dr. Lori started coming to our school um, on a regular basis to actually work in the classroom with the children and then with, with a staff member present and then to reflect with us after um, she got done in the classroom. And it's been so powerful for us. So it's, it's just been a miracle. So um, she's 
she's taught us about brain development. She's taught us about um, attachment, adversity, what happens to children. And I will tell you, our children have become more successful and our culture has changed at St. Mary's. Um, I knew the first day that she came that wonderful things were gonna happen. She asked, first of all, what's the most difficult time of your day? And I immediately responded, nap time. And I could tell you, until 2011, we only served children half day. So we had never had children go down for nap until 2011. And when it was time for them to go to nap, they didn't go down. And um, I have to tell you, part of the issue is that, you know, we thought we were pretty good at doing the work, and we had every adult um, in the whole building down patting people's backs at nap. And I was a little bit embarrassed because I also know that there were thousands of people within a mile of all of our locations that were putting children down for nap and they were actually going to sleep. So, and this has gone on since 2011. So in 2017, Dr. Lori asked me that and I said it was nap. And I explained to her that our children were spitting and hitting, crying, attempting to throw cots and run out of the room. So Dr. Lori just looked at me and said, well, of course, of course, your nap time would be hard because you serve so many children in poverty. And she said, children who experience adversity and poverty are scared to close their eyes. And I felt kind of bad because all this time, and I hadn't figured it out and I didn't know it. But we know it now. And not, she didn't just leave it there. She told us what to do about it. So we now wash all their blankets in lavender. We made yarn balls that they can take and hold while they sleep. And then we wash them in lavender. Um, we have sound machines in our classrooms during nap time. And she taught the child, children rhythmic activities that they do on their cot when they get ready to lie down that actually results in them lying down and going to sleep. So I can tell you the between 12.30 and one o'clock is no longer the excited period of time that it used to be. Um, people go down, they go, they go take it down. So um, from that viewpoint, um, it's a peaceful time at St. Mary's. So we're so happy to be with you today. And I'm going to invite Doc, um, Diane here um, to take you deeper into the learning um, and the experiences. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Um, please bear with me. This is our first time presenting this presentation, and so I'm going to be more note-bound than I like to be. Um, but we're going to hopefully we'll have some great things for to share with you. You might be familiar with this. This a series of photographs. This is from Reggio Emilia, and it's documenting a moment of learning. And I just. I felt like this was the way I had to start this presentation because it's going to show brains, brain, a, a brain growth. So this is a little toddler and he's looking with his teacher at this catalog of wristwatches. The teacher then allows him to investigate her watch. And then she encourages him. She puts it up to his ears and kind of encourages him to listen. So obviously, this is not a digital watch. It's <laughs> um, and the next, the next slide, get ready for it, is, is where brilliance happens. <laughs> is, is that awesome? Like, like just, it, it's like cute, uh, but like it is brilliant. And, and that's what's happening with children all the time. You know, he's obviously listening to see if the picture is going to make that same TikTok noise. I just, I just love that. And it's important for us to, as we work with early childhood, young children, all, every moment of life is kind of new. They are seeing things all the time that are fresh. And so this is not easy to read. I've just kind of pulled out a few facts, but we're talking about brain development here. And so something, I just am gonna share a few notable things. At birth, the brain has 200 billion brain cells. During the first year of life, that brain grows 1.7 grams a day. 
And as we know, babies need loving interaction, touch, and parents who are tuned into their needs as much as they need nutrition. By age two, the brain reaches about 75% of adult weight, which is amazing to me. Toddlers have more than 100 trillion cells by age two, uh, <laughs> the most that they'll have in their life. So a two-year-old has more brain cells than somebody that's in college. And maybe they've talked about that with you due to pruning. Um, that's pretty wild to me as well. At this time, the brain structure has the overall appearance of, a, of an adult brain. Okay. And so, a little bit more about brain development. The brain develops from the back to the front and from the inside out. When adversity forces us into a state of survival, and I know that you've heard about the fight or flight response, that takes over. When that takes over, there are no circuits built for sharing, for empathy, or kindness for many, because their experiences haven't taught them that. Experiences in the environment grow brains. And so that's where Dr. Lori intercepted with us, because we had this, we felt that we had this gap where we have lots of tools in our belt to work with children in poverty, and we really work to be developmentally appropriate, but we just, there was something missing, and so Dr. Lori kind of has filled that gap for us. So we talk about applied neuroscience, educational neuroscience. It's a framework, it's not a program. It's not something that says, okay, day one do this, now do this, now do this. You have to have this overall understanding and then tailor it as, as you go. We look at both the educator and the student brain states. And that's really important. Um, first, for when we talk about the educator brain states, kind of in two, two levels. First of all, what they're going with, going on, what's going on in their lives personally, but then also the stress that they're feeling being in that classroom. Like that, that stress is real. And we know, we try to tag out and you know, give, give teachers a break sometimes or have a child visit a different room. Sometimes that's a break for the child as well. But, but it's really important. And so some of these strategies that Dr. Lori has taught us, um, our educators do it with the children. In fact, I've got a video, um, one video with the brain bath that we're gonna share with you. And as, as she finished, the teacher, I stopped the camera and the teacher looked at me, she goes, oh, that is so calming for me too. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Um, okay, and um, the title of our, of our presentation was very intentional in including the word relationships. And Dr. Bruce Perry, who you've probably heard a lot about him, relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. It really is, when we talk about the Regio philosophy, we talk about the image of the child and the importance of foundation, how foundational relationships are. It's, it's, in, it's necessary for, for all our humanity, um, and we know that. So discipline, we get this question a lot. So how do you guys, what do you do at St. Mary's? How do you do discipline? Um, first, I wanna share the, the uh, picture and the words on the left. A hurtful child is a hurt-filled child. Trying to change the hurtful behavior by punishing her is like pulling off only the top part of a weed. If you don't get to the root, the hurtful behavior pops up elsewhere. Which, that, that just makes so much sense to me. And um, I love this, Dr. Laurie has talked with us about this. Traditional discipline works best with the children who need it the least. And so there are times when, when we are doing things and I, you know, it's just not working. Well, if it's not working, then we need, to go, we need to go deeper into what does that child need. We need a new lens. Um, let's see. So at St. Mary's, we've always used positive discipline with our students. It's our job to teach the children appropriate behavior in this place called school. When a child doesn't know something in math, we teach them. When a child doesn't know something in reading, we teach them. When a child doesn't know how to play basketball, we teach them. So why would it be any different and why would we punish them when they don't know the proper behavior? So social emotional behaviors 
need to be taught. And, so, and a lot of our children, especially the children that we have, they might not be learning those proper, appropriate responses at home. So neurodevelopment and neuroregulation. Out of this slide, to me, the most important thing is that top one. All behavior is communication. If, if whatever the child is doing, there's communication there. It might not be the communication that you want to hear. It might be that they are looking for negative um, attention, possibly. They might not be paying attention in the way that you want, but all behavior is communication. We, as adults, need to listen to that. A child that's dysregulated in the midst of a tantrum is not going to be able to digest how to make a pattern or how to identify colors. You know, they're in the moment of that, of that tantrum. We need to calm the amygdala and meet the child where they are in brain development before we move to academics. That's not saying like weeks and weeks of calming. It's just saying you, you have to deal with that emotion before you can go on. And, and part of our mission this semester as we work with Dr. Lori is, is figuring out some very predictable regular routines that, that happen within the classroom right from the start when the kids walk in they're coming into a calm place, they're hearing calm music, the sound machines Connie mentioned could be on, not just at nap time. Um, they start with yoga exercises and just some of these brain strategies that we'll share. So they, they learn them in calmness and then they are available to them when they are going through that dysregulated time. The teachers start to, you, you, you know when your child's about to go off or and, and sometimes if a child has, is living in chronic stress, they come in and they're like up to here with stress. So you look at them sideways and they could go off. And it's like, well, what'd I do? <laughs> but it's just what that, that child is so filled and on the brink. So we try to just start, start with calm activities for the whole, for everybody. And so we'll share that as we go on. Uh, it's something that Dr. Lurie wanted to make sure that we mentioned. Adversity and the stress response affect the actual biology of the brain and the body. Like it changes your brain and your body. And so we have to work to change it back before that gets hardwired. And so um, on the left, I, I love this. Dr. Lurie had this on her Facebook page. 64 hours is a long time to go without the positive affirmations of a caring adult. By Monday morning, many of our students will have done just that. On Monday morning, don't let an hour, another hour pass. Let them know I see you. And you, it, you might not think about it that way, but they could, that, that's how some children come in. When we know a student, and this is my summary of, of all those words, um, when we know a student is experiencing stress and adversity, it is important that we, as a school, respond by connecting with that student. It could be 30 seconds or five minutes, a verbal ex exchange with validation, giving a smile, noticing a smile. Dr. Perry, Dr. Perry discusses dosing a child with experiences and social interactions that create connections. That will contribute to healthy brain development. That's how we're going to get those wires, those good, healthy wires connecting. The story. So this, this slide is talking, uh, I just love this quote from Annette Bro. Remember, everyone in the classroom has a story that leads to misbehavior or defiance. Nine times out of ten, the story behind the misbehavior won't make you angry. It will break your heart. So I'm going to take a moment and be vulnerable in front of you. <laughs> um, if you know me, you know that sometimes I cry. Um, and I want to share this story with you. I, I'm already getting, getting crackly voice, but um, it is a story of my friend Nathan, who I had in kindergarten. And um, this was some years back. So this is Nathan's story. I'm going to read it because I think I'll stay with you better so that you can like know what I'm saying. So Nathan's story. When I taught kindergarten a few years back, I met Nathan. Nathan was a great little guy, but he had a way of getting under my skin. I tried all of my tricks, and after 15 years, I had many. But I wasn't able to get through. I requested a conference with Nathan's family, not to get him in trouble, 
but rather to find out how things were handled at home. I am always up for learning new tricks. I am, I am also a firm believer in working with the family to present a united front to the child. I will never forget that family conference. Sorry. I feel like I'm sitting right there with them right now. <laughs> Nathan's paternal grandparents and an aunt and uncle came to the meeting. It was obvious they all cared very much for Nathan and wanted to improve his school experience. I found out so much in that meeting. Nathan's mom had recently been incarcerated. The family was working to care for him amidst their own lives and jobs. As we were there, they were literally trying to work out where Nathan would sleep that night due to shift work and overtime hours. It was then that I realized Nathan literally did not know where he would be sleeping from one night to the next. No wonder I was seeing this behavior. From that day on, I made sure that I greeted him with my brightest smile when he came in. During our possibility time, I made sure to notice what he was doing and give him positive feedback. And before he went out the door at the end of the day, he got a hug and an affirmation of having a great day. I wanted to make sure he knew that I saw him, and I truly did. I'm not sure if it was the family meeting, these intentional interactions, my new understanding of what Nathan was going through, or a combination of all of them. But Nathan and I got along wonderfully for the rest of the year. I was giving him needed positive attention on the front end, which seemed to help the negative behaviors go away. I will never forget Nathan or what he taught me. So that's Nathan. I did it. <laughs> OK. So I won't talk too much about the ACEs since you just had a presentation on that. But here are some things. And this, this slide is basically a point of, of the physical things that happen with the ACEs. So they change the architecture of the brain. Uh, trigger inflammation in both the brain and the body. Adversity can become rooted in the body's immune system. Your emotional biography becomes your physical biology. And early childhood stress reprograms how we'll, we will react to stress our entire lives, which is why it's so important the earlier we can to, to try to change that wiring. And that last fact is, is important for us too. Early unpredictable stress is most damaging. So if you have that child who sometimes they're going home and everything's fine and then they go home and all of a sudden every, everything is bad, they, they don't know what they're going to come home to, that is really, really hard on their system. This is why we discuss educational neuroscience. It changes the brain. So we talk about meeting students developmentally with when they have these adver ad, uh, adversities, sorry, this is how they might present at dif different ages. So ages three to six might look like ADD symptoms, excitable, aggressive, and sometimes maybe violent. The child that's ages seven to 10 years old might look like depression, anxiety, and aggression, and this is due to low serotonin oftentimes. And ages 12 and older, it might look like bipolar and borderline personality disorders. So these are neurobi neurobiological reasons. They are not bad children. And that's something when they were talking at the other presentation about switching our, switching our lens. That's, they, they don't want to be in this dysregulated state. It's just they don't know how to be otherwise. So that's our job to help them. They need a gentle, soft, loving environment. So what does all this mean? Stressors without buffers change the brain. Significant adversity in the first year of life is correlated to worse, worse health outcomes. We have to focus on early developmental interventions. And we need to teach our students. They have not learned the typical responses. And, and we have talked about this as a staff with Dr. Lori. Um, achievement gaps are adversity gaps. So um, Connie had talked about 
when um, children in poverty enter school, they're often a year and a half to two years behind. And when they leave St. Mary's, we, our goal is always to close that gap. And we have, it was 83%, 83% of the students left with 100% um, on all domains at age level when they leave for kindergarten this past year. So, so we're talking about closing that. Thank you. <laughs> but um, that is, that's a big deal for them to start off, start off so strongly as they enter into school. And so um, the adversity gap is a real thing. Um, so exposure to patterns of stress, food and housing insecurity, and repetitive patterns of stress activation leads to a sensitized stress response, which means anything new is potentially threatening. So a child will be on guard because they're not sure what to expect. And instead of having that open curiosity and ready to accept the world, they're, they're more closed off and not uh, afraid to take that risk. And so Nadine says, when our stress response systems are in good working order, it can save our lives. When it is not and out of balance, it shortens our lives, which is pretty scary to think about that. Have you seen this picture today? No. So this, this picture has been around for a long time and it's showing on the left is a healthy brain and the temporal lobes are in the white circle and that is where, um, let's see, brain, uh, temporal lobes where early childhood experiences wire the circuits. So that's, that's all the positive emotion. Um, and so the more colors that you see, the healthier that brain is. If you look at the abused brain on the, on the right, that, that brain has, when it has um, endured a, abuse of neglect, just not, not being talked to and interacted with. And it used to be, when this first came out, scientists presented this as, you know, it's, it's doomed. It's too bad this child had no early childhood experiences or not enough. And so, you know, they're, they're gonna have a really rough life. But what we know now, scientists used to think that, that they were doomed. Research shows us now that the brain has neuroplasticity, which with meaningful relationships and strategies to calm the amygdala, neural connections can be made. It just takes time in a caring adult. So it's, it's very hopeful there. So talking about strategies and interventions, what, how can, what are some things that we need to make sure we incorporate? Smiling eyes. Validating eye contact. Warmth of voice. Playful engagement. And this is the thing that I really want you to hear. So 400 repetitions are needed to get one synapse in the brain. But if they are accompanied, accompanied with joy and laughter, that 400 goes down to 12. Like, just think about that. And, and if you have that joy and laughter in your, in your school, in your classroom, like it's more fun for everybody, and the learning is gonna be that much easier. And one, one of our, um, at St. Mary's, one of our things on our job description is you must bring your joy. So. <laughs> okay, I think I'm gonna, are there any questions or comments before we go into this next part? Okay. So we're gonna be going into, this is where we're gonna share with you some videos of, of strategies that Dr. Lori has talked about. Um, up on the top left are um, just paint sticks that you can get free at Lowe's or the different places. And she talked with us about rhythm and the, impo and the importance of just doing rhythm, that that is calming to the amygdala. You know, they had the drums, the bongo drums 
which is awesome. We've, we've actually brought in some bongo drums and different types of things to be used as drums with the children. And they will do those beats. They kind of catch on the beat. And then other children might be dancing with scars um, if they feel like it. That, is, that has been very calming for them. On the right to the next of that are rhythm sticks, chimes, and the singing bowl. And we'll talk about the singing bowl in a minute. Um, We'll, we'll show you, uh, Dr. Lori talks about waking up the singing bowl, but the chimes will also, will also, uh, they'll use that in that way. Instead of just using it as an attention getter to get their attention to look at you or to stop their activity or get ready for cleanup, um, she uses it, we're talking about self-regulation, and so having, having the um, patience to to hear the sound of the chime or the singing bowl, and then you wait, and she'll also encourage them to go, uh, and hum with it, and that that is making them slow down and calm. Um, the children love it, and they, they tune in, and some, a lot of times we bought a singing bowl for each of our classrooms, and so there's kind of an area of, of different things that would be calming to the amygdala, and the children can, can go there. That I have lots of video showing the singing bowl, and there are some children that want to, it is not that easy to make it wake up, as she did. And so when she introduces it with them, she'll let them uh, circle it and then tap it lightly. Well, some of them, <laughs> when they first get it, it's like, bam! And we talk about not breaking the singing bowl. But um, she's, she's also introduced where, where they do the, ah, and then, um, jiggle, jiggle their Adam's apple, ah, and they think that that's a riot. So, so just know, like some of the things we're showing you, there are, it's not like there's just one way to do it. In fact, we're encouraged to kind of keep changing it up a little bit to keep it fresh for the children, but you're still getting the same effect. Um, can you see where that would be calming to, to children? We could play it again if you would like to try it. Would you like to? You gonna pass? Okay. <laughs> um, so we have blowing bubbles and lavender. So the bubbles, um, this was interesting. So b blowing bubbles is always awesome for kids. They love to run and pop them. So when, when we talk about regulation, what Dr. Lori talked to us about is working on having them wait like, okay, let's see if we can wait, if we can count to five before we pop any bubbles, or count to three. And you would not believe how hard that is. I mean, that's really difficult for a three-year-old. So, so she, the teachers were giving her that feedback in our debriefing sessions, and she said, you could maybe have them sit on their hands, and, and they kind of just do it, do it for fun. And it, it's really like building their capacity to self-regulate. In the, and that's one, one way to do it. Um, a story that I thought was really funny. So Dr. Lori said, you could also have them pop, do, pop the bubbles with their eyes. And what she's meaning is the bubbles are blown and you're going like this and, and like blinking them, popping them by blinking. But our cho children that are preschool, you know, they're very literal. And so they were trying to hit the bubbles with their eyes. I just love that. <laughs> um, with the lavender, so this just happened on Friday. Um, as Connie said, we, we wash our blankets. And if children have an accident and we wash clothes, we, we have the lavender scent. And we ha there's our site director, Lisa, was sharing with me that a little guy was really really trying to con convince her that he needed to change his clothes so he could put some of our clothes on. And she asked him, she said, honey, why, you're, there's nothing wrong. Your clothes aren't dirty. You didn't have an accident. He says, well, yours smells so good. And so, <laughs> and so she made sure that he had a blanket for nap time that had been freshly, freshly scented. <laughs> um, but it, it does make a difference. And we've, we bought some cotton balls to have, um, and just using like lavender essential oil where you put it on, or the pom-poms, the yarn pom-pom balls. And we've also put them on bean bags, the, that oil. Just that smell, they cuddle up with that for nap time and it's, 
it is very calming. I shared it with my daughter to use with the grandkids because, you know, sometimes you just need whatever you need. <laughs> Walking the line is, um, okay, I just want to say a few things so you know what you're looking at. So Dr. Lori had come a little early and she had this colored duct tape and she, she put it down in kind of an obstacle course fashion. So there's like a straight line and then it goes to two lines and then two squares and a triangle and then a, a, a double line and a straight line. So there's not, again, not anything magical about those different ways, just, just something that you can do and, and she, she <laughs> um, when she did it, she prompted them. She said, okay, I, she, she picked up a little plastic animal, like a giraffe or something, and said, I have to get this giraffe across the river. And so she told them that everything, on, if you weren't on the line, it was the river, so you don't want to fall into the river. And, and so she kind of modeled to them, walking on the line when they got to the, when they got to the um, shapes, they had to hop, and then the other shape, they had to jump. So the next one is, we're going to talk about, wait, is a peanut butter sandwich, which is very fun. Um, and what, what she is working on is giving, giving uh, pre deep pressure to inform the child's muscles. Um, and you'll see, this is kind of, as, I'm going to share some teacher reflections later as well. And these things are, as the teacher does this, it's really building relationships as well. Like they're giving that special time and doing some specific things. So she, she has them lay on a pillow, like a big body pillow. The child lays on that and she first spreads the peanut butter. So she says it's going to be a peanut butter sandwich and you can put whatever else you want on it. So when she's press, she's like pressing on their, on their body, on their arms, on their back, on their legs. And then she asked them, what do they want to put on it? And they asked for some interesting things. Um, one of them wanted chicken and barbecue sauce. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we'll have to see what this one, I, I can't remember which one this one has. But, um, and then one, she, she wanted sprinkles too. And so you could see she's using all this different sensory input on, onto this child. Then when that's all done, she puts the top pillow on and she's, she's really pushing down and giving more sensory input into those muscles. What, what I think is so amazing, and you'll see it with the, this little girl I believe that I picked, um, they are so relaxed at the end of that. Like you wouldn't, you would think that they might just get all revved up about it, but, but there were several children that, that we had to really coax them to get up. Like they just wanted to lay there. Um, or, or they'd get up and they were begging to do it again. So it's another thing that we just have these pillows in the, in the room or in the, it, a lot of times it's in the piazza and they might ask if they could go do a peanut butter sandwich. Um, so, so they kind of know when they need it. And so doing that, if you have a child who's coming, coming into school and they're up to here with stress and all tight, like we talk about them being just tightly wound, if you, if you start off with an activity like that, an offering to do that, maybe after they've had their breakfast, um, it's, it's wonderful. It, it really does make a difference. So the brain bath, I, what I want to do is talk you through how Dr. Lori actually does it because I, I, I didn't have any appropriate videos um, just because of some photo releases that I could share of Dr. Lori doing it. Um, and so, so Pam obliged me and she did their version. So it's kind of, it's, it's a little different. But so Dr. Lori, when she talks about a brain bath, we get the, the uh, loofah, like the, the netting, this plastic netting things like for the bath and she'll get one and she talks to the children, we're gonna take a brain bath. And what was really funny, uh, one of the first times that we did it, um, a little girl was very concerned that she was gonna get, if, if they stayed in the water too long, she was gonna get pruny fingers. And um, we said, well, we're not gonna really go in the water. <laughs> and so she was okay with that. But so she has them sit 
um, with their legs out and she takes the loofah and she's kind of pressing along kind of in the same places that you saw her on this video. So it's, it's kind of the same purpose, just trying to give input into the muscles and to calm the amygdala. And so she's, she's washing and she talks about putting on the bubbles and doing this and she's kind of got that nice rhythmic voice going. And then she said, okay, next thing, what, what do we have to do next when we're in the bath? We have to, we have to um, rinse, rinse off all the soap. So she does that. And then she's got this big towel and they stand up. She says, okay, ne next we have to dry off. So she wraps them really tight with, with the towel around and then takes, um, Pam does it more loosely than, than Lori does normally, but she kind of gives it good, good input and she's kind of rubbing up and down and their legs and their back. And she says, okay, you're all dry. And sometimes she'll offer them um, lotion if we have that okay. Um, per licensing and all that good stuff. But, um, and, and the, a lot of times it's the same thing. They want to have another brain bath. And we've tried to make those materials available so that children could do that. And, and I, in one of the teacher reflections, I'll show you, we have a picture of children doing the brain bath to each other, which is very sweet. Um, okay, so we're gonna see Pam's version. Hold on a sec. Um, Pam's version, you're gonna see her doing some deep breathing that we talk about. And she does um, a, a brain interval, I think you would call it. Cal it's calming, where you take and you trace your finger with the other finger. And, and one way that you could use this strategy is on paper. If a child is really um, kind of having a hard time, they know now that that's something the teacher, would you like to trace your hand? And, and it'll either be in the air like that or on a piece of paper. And, um, and it's like you just keep doing it till you feel better if, if a child is dysregulated. So they do that and they do some breathing. And Pam is the one who, has, as soon as the video is over, she goes, oh, that makes me feel better. Um, she also, you can Google, Dr. Lori talks to us about um, brain calming music. So if you just Google that, brain calming music, it is a certain number of decibels. And um, so Pam pulled that up on her phone to do this brain bath. Okay.
These are dragon breaths, and that's the fire coming out. And there are a few things um, that I wanted to say also. You know, when she was doing, having him clench, clench and release, we talk about how that is, uh, that they are, the child is actually letting go of stress when they, when they clench and then release, that's actually helping them to release some of that stress that's kind of stuck in their body. And so that's very good. She obviously is doing much more than a sensory bath. She's kind of just showing you several techniques all at once. And that works well for her when she's doing this with children or maybe partic that particular child. When I went into the classroom and said, you know, do I have a volunteer to do a brain bath for me on video? Um, she said, yeah, I'll do it. And, and immediately she looked at the other teacher and they, and they came up with this child's name. Um, because they knew that he would say yes. And, and they just, you know, he was playing and, and she said, hey, you want a brain bath? He, yeah, he just dropped what he was doing, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's something when you, when you figure out what, what those things are that will help that child, you know, that's, like Connie said, you're building that relationship, you're connecting with them and you're helping them to, to release and grow their brain. Oh, one other thing. Um, the squeezes that she was doing. Um, it also reminds me of one of, another coworker of our Sandy. She, if, if there's some issues at nap time and somebody's having trouble calming, uh, a lot of times Sandy gets, goes in and she does, she does the squeezes like up and down their arms and up and down their legs and they are out like within a few minutes. So if you're having trouble, that might be something to put in your back pocket because it, it is helpful. And I, I think it's, again, just releasing that stress. Okay. So the question was um, that she noticed there were other children in the classroom for the other video and for the brain bath, it was quiet. <laughs> because we had three videos of the brain bath and it was so loud or children were popping in that were not okay, like through the semester, I, I chose to do that because it was literally Thursday. <laughs> and so um, it doesn't, Sometimes we will take them to the, what space they were in is the piazza, kind of a, or a gross motor room, so someplace separate. But, but it's also built, it's a good question, because it's also built in to, to be there as a strategy for children to go to in the, in the classroom if needed. So it kind of just depends on the situation. Is there another question? Okay, so for, if you didn't hear, um, she's saying that some administrators are talking about trying to get rid of rest time because they're not sleeping. Is that what age level is this? Four and five. So it, it is different children drop that at certain times, but we still, even if they drop it, we have, they lay on their cots for 30 minutes of quiet time at least. And I think that there is, I don't know. I think there is a need for that. Correct. 
like to take a breath. And sometimes once they actually, the child actually lets themselves relax, like they are really out. <laughs> and, but it is true, some at four and five drop their nap, especially if they're getting to sleep, if they're getting enough sleep the rest of the day. What I'd be concerned about is the children who are not, like, like my friend Nathan was not getting sleep that he needed. He's, he slept at, at nap time once, once we got to that place of him being okay to close his eyes. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd probably look, look into, res there's got to be research on, on the number of hours a child needs to sleep. Um, this last one is a, a video on tapping. And, and this is just a, a visual that we got off of the internet. There's, have, you, have any of you heard of tapping? Okay, so when Dr. Lori was presenting this to us in a staff training, like she had us do it with her, and I, I would, I'm going to ask you to tap with me after the video, but it felt so good. Um, in fact, yesterday when, or it was yesterday, when Pam said to me, oh man, that really calms me down. I said, oh, I'm gonna probably need to do that before, before the presentation Saturday. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the tapping, like Connie and I, we've been in meetings where we're looking over and we see each other, you know, doing, doing some of those moves. But, um, okay, so take a look at the, the chart, the tapping points, and why don't we just try some of these? You wanna try tapping with, with both hands um, right above your eyebrows maybe three or four times, and then under your eyes, and your outer eye. I like the eyes, obviously. Um, below the nose. I don't like this one that much, I don't know why. but Maybe it works for some people. And then your collarbone. And under your armpit and the top of your head. Doesn't that feel kind of nice? If you're stressing out or having a hard time going to sleep, you might want to try it. <laughs> but the, ch the children do like it. Okay. Okay, so part of our, as we work with Dr. Lori, she comes um, during the semester, she comes a total of eight times for an hour and a half and she goes to two classrooms, a half hour each classroom, and then a half hour of debriefing where she comes and talks with our curriculum coach and Connie and I, if we are able to be there, and then the two teachers she worked with. And she talks about the strategies that she presented in the classroom. And then on the teacher's end, we ask them every Wednesday to send us reflections about, about things that they have tried throughout, the, throughout that time. And so, so some of these I'm going to read everything, and some uh, it's kind of there. I, but I, I, I don't know. I think I will read it because I think it helps you as educators. So Ariel now, Ariel is um, the little one who is, is crying. She, and she was having separation anxiety as she started. She started a little later into the school year. Ariel now requests to have a brain bath and sit on my lap to wake up the singing bowl. She has even started to do the tapping on her own and tells me I do it. We have a new friend that started early last week and she's having separation anxiety at drop off. She has responded very well. She has responded really well to a, a few of our girls in class. They have helped with, with her by rocking, tapping, and even using the singing bowl. Yarley has, has really reacted to rocking and likes to listen to the singing bowl from a distance. So she's not quite made it all the way to front and center with it. I have a roller that the children also like to use to rub on their legs, arms, or head. So I don't know if you can see that blue. It's something that you might use with, with Play-Doh or clay. And they have introduced it as, as a tool. And again, it's gonna give that, that compression. And I just think it's very sweet that the children are trying to help each other with these strategies. Mm -hmm. Let's take a brain bath. I just had to include this picture, like this, the one on the right. I just love this. And so that's, that's the loofah that we talked about. 
And so she, she loves brain baths. We first used the loofah to squish and make bubbles. She almost melted when I dried her off. You could immediately see a difference in her brain state after the brain bath. It really is powerful. Okay. This week we introduced the brain bath. Children loved it and of course everyone wanted a chance to take a bath. Some children responded more to the pat or washing with the loofah, but others enjoyed the comfort of the towel being wrapped around them to dry. And we find that that's, that's interesting. Different children are going to respond different ways. You just want to kind of pay attention to that and focus on that more with them and try to bring in other creative ways of, of giving them those sensations that they need. Because you, you can, when, when the words melted, like really you can see it. And again, that was two children doing it with each other. And here are some more reflections. I've really worked on various exercises or activities more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Ariel and I have practiced various breathing activities upon arrival and dur during various times of the day when she is dysregulated. I'm gonna just throw in here, there's times, um, and Dr. Lori has learned this as she's worked with us. Sometimes she would come into a classroom and we do three or four in the classroom, uh, pull them over. But there's so much other stuff going on in the class, you kind of have kids coming in and out. It, it might just be easier to take a small group to another area, and we try to do that on the days that Dr. Lori's there, so that they learn the strategy in a little quieter space, and then it's available in the classroom. Does that make sense? Um, because they kind of know what, what it is that they're doing. Um, oh, one other thing I want to say. Um, something like the sensory bath can take a little while to do. And when Dr. Lori first did it, she was kind of introducing it to a group of maybe six or seven. And that was a long time for them to wait. So when she modified it to go to the next classroom, she only had like three children. And once they had their brain bath, they moved on so that they weren't sitting there. Because then you're just asking for other behaviors to come up. <laughs> um, we've been practicing using the breathing ball and the brain bath. These exercises have also helped build our relationship together and she's much more comfortable in the classroom, which is what we've been saying. We, we really see that relationship building. She's having more positive interactions with me and other children. When we get close to rest time, I believe she's trying hard to stay awake. She becomes restless. Today I just started tapping between her eyes and began singing an I love you ritual. She wanted me to sing it again and I asked her if I could try tapping under her eyes and on top of her head. She replied with yes. She was asleep in, within a few minutes. It's magical. <laughs> scarves and drums. So this week we've started to use rhythm with scarves and various renditions of a drum. The children really enjoy music so it was great to see a big group wanting to participate in some movement activities. I did find a few metronomes on YouTube that incre increase the tempo over time. So I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure I shouted that out to you as a, as a resource. So YouTube has all kinds of things and you can find metronomes that have varying speeds. Um, when Dr. Lori was introducing some of this, she would talk to them about, okay, let's do it fast, let's do it slow. And they weren't really reacting, but I explained in our debriefing that that's that's like a preschool skill to, to learn. So, so we're working on those foundations at the same time as we are helping them regulate. Uh, this was challenging for some of the children, but after several freeze moments, they really caught on. Many of the children enjoyed the larger scarves. When trying to ball them up and throw them, they really needed to focus and put their energy into trying to get the scarf as small as they could. She brought us, you know, Sometimes you talk about scarves and they're the, the, the square ones that are about this big. She brought these giant ones. Like they had to be two feet, like a two foot square, may, maybe three foot square. So that it was a challenge to get it all balled up in your hand. But that activity was good for their muscle input as well. And then they throw it up and it really did look very beautiful. Um, so. So then she, she's talking about when they did this activity, the children enjoyed playing the drum 
and continued to have children dance with the scars even after they were finished with the activity. So they, they carried it on. And I love this. Sorry for the blurry pictures. So I had to share the blurry pictures. <laughs> but if you can see in that, that top left, there, those two young men have paint sticks and they were, they were using the table and the chairs as, as um, drums. And he got some, some containers and turned them over for drums. And then here we have some dancing going on. And this is just showing some breathing techniques. Have you seen this ball? That's very, very cool. And sometimes they want to they wanna make it really big. And we had to talk to them about not going too big because you don't want to break it apart. But so, so we do, it starts up scrunched up and you breathe in and breathe out. And so if you have a group of three or four, one child has the ball and the others are doing it with an imaginary ball and, and doing the activity. On the right, um, this is another breathing activity. And I wanted, th this is just a, a little personal side note. So that's my granddaughter in the middle with the pink shirt. Um, and she kept, my daughter FaceTimed me and she said, what is she doing? And she was, she was going <laughs> and, um, and so Danielle is trying to do it. And she said, no, mommy, both hands. And so, <laughs> so that, this is what you're supposed to do. And, and the idea is that you are letting, blowing up a balloon and letting out the air. Um, so I explained to my daughter, like she, she just didn't understand the concept. And Tenley was just wanting to do it whenever, whenever, uh, when she was playing teacher, I guess. And so I told her, I said, so what she, she likes that strategy. If she gets upset, and she gets upset every now and then, you know, three years old, um, when she's upset, tell her, you know, I see that you're upset. Let's try blowing up a balloon. And uh, wouldn't you know, the next morning, she was having a fit about something at breakfast and, and would, not, would not come in. I don't even know what the problem was, but I got a FaceTime and, um, and you see Tenley sitting on the chair and she's, she's obviously been crying. And Danielle said, well, um, Tenley, Tenley's upset. And so I told her if she wanted to calm down, she could blow up the balloon and we would make a video for you. Um, and so, so that's why they FaceTimed me so that I could see it. And, and it was pretty awesome. Actually, I have that video, but I don't have it to share. But she, she did it, and, um, and I was doing it on FaceTime with her, and she was watching me. She did it, and then she just looked at Danielle, and Danielle said, are you ready to go back to the kitchen now? She said, yes, and she just walked back. So me sharing that, that is nothing like the, the stress and, that our children face. Like, I know that, you know, she's got a pretty nice little life. But, you know, every, every, every little person, they have some kind of st stress in their life. So, uh, go to the next page, yeah. So this is just a visual of Monica. She was, um, the, the two pictures on the left are her on Monday morning. Very upset, just kind of getting used to this idea of school. And, and the teacher sat with her and let her try the bowl and was doing it with her. And on Wednesday, two days later, this is her independently going to the bowl. So um, it was really something of comfort for her. All right, so to connect with um, Connie or myself or Dr. Lori, here's, here's what you need. Um, as Connie said, Dr. Lori has a Facebook page at one point, I thought Facebook cut her off because she had so many people following her because whenever she does, does uh, presentations, she'll give out her information. Um, but she also has Twitter, a Twitter account. And um, go, ahead, go ahead one more. This is her newest book that's about to come out. Um, originally, it was supposed to come out in October, but it's not yet. So you can just keep your eyes open for that but eyes are never quiet. And she talks about a lot of these strategies that we talked about, kind of had an early childhood component into, in this book. So you might be interested in that. One more. 
And these are her other two story, her stories, listen to me, her um, other two books that she has written as well. I hope that this has been helpful to you. We appreciate your being here and listening. It's, it's really important work and, and it's made a difference at St. Mary's. So we hope that it will do the same for you. Thank you.